Well, you look great. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had I had it last holiday season over Christmas time, and it's not fun. My wife had it for four months. Um, for in four twenty, months? yeah, she had it. She was a long hauler before they had a name for it. Um, and so, um, I'm pretty sure I had it in 2020 because <laughs> she had it for four months. Right. Oh, so, likely uh, so. A bunch of us went to a event last Thursday in DC for campaign for tobacco free kids, and the the text messages started oh, no. this morning that they'd gone cut traced oh, and no. at least three of us from Hopkins have COVID now wow so oh. it just you know and that was like they were so careful we all had to upload vaccinations and um, boosters and and thankfully like they have all our contacts so they could tell us what was going on so that's uh would you um, would you like to go first so that you can then like? I think it doesn't matter. I think whatever the back makes door and go take a nap. Whatever makes the most sense. It's only an hour, so I don't think it really matters. So, it's um whatever plan you had. I didn't. I didn't have a plan. <laughs> sure. I mean, it's mine is the um, quirky one, right? Like the uh, it's um it's pretty niche. My certificate, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're all niche. That's kind of the point. I guess, so. yeah. Well, why don't we do that? And that okay. way, if you're feeling great and you want to stay fantastic, and if yeah. not, <laughs> sure. completely understood. Cool. I have nothing to write with. Where did my pen go? And it was like 10 or 15 minutes, right? We were aiming for. Yeah, because yeah. there's three of you. And so, you know. Yeah. Yep. But it's nice to have space for questions. And did we set it up so that participants could um, put uh, content in the chat? I believe so. Yeah, it's, we didn't use the webinar format. Right. That yeah, yeah. The regular Zoom. Because I have a game in my presentation. Cool. I'm all a bit about engagement, you know. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Especially since it's voluntary, right? It's totally voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> but we are recording, so we can go back and see. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. Sorry. It's not voluntary for you, Paul. It's required. But... Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> oh, sure.
Good evening, Dr. Carriero. How are you? I am fine. And yourself? Fine, thank you. Good. Um, we have three panelists this evening, so we're just going to go in order of showing upage on Zoom. Would you like to go second? Myself, that's fine. Great, thank you. If you go third, you have to sing your whole presentation, right? Is that how it works? That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's good. In Spanish. Go That's, yeah. I'm going first, so I'm going to dance my whole presentation. So, Ashley, you can translate, right? Because interpretive dance is your first language, I think. Is that, am I remembering? It's my second, but thank you for okay. remembering. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Details are important. Well, thank goodness we're recording this session. <laughs> no one's going to want to miss that. Where's your background, Christina? Um, it's the Commons in Boston. Boston, a I thought so. Years ago. Yep. <laughs> Is it the Commons or the Gardens across the streets? Um, I don't. In the one of the two, that that day we just kind of like walked through everything. So yeah, between there. Well, we all get extra points for being early. It's actually only 631, so I'm going to give it another few minutes. <laughs> I can't wait to cash in these points. <laughs> wait till you see the variety of wonderful prizes we have. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Mountain getaway. <laughs> If you, if you go first, Ryan, you don't have to sing, but your prize is, I'm going to give you my jury summons. So oh. you, get to, you get to go serve you my know, jury and do your civic duty in my place. Lucky you. You know what? I am not a citizen. And that is one of the things that I <laughs> do not have to do. <laughs> well, I am not the person whose name is on this piece of paper. They got that wrong. So you never know. So you open someone else's mail? No, that, that is a crime. I would never do such a thing. Well, it appears here you did. <laughs> no, I opened my mail. They just got my name wrong. Oh. But that's okay. a, details, details. It's so Albert, Albert, who's going to tell Albert that he's um. Oh, singing? oh, Dr. Wu, we're terribly sorry to inform you that um, the bylaws, as stated, indicate uh -huh. that those who come last have to sing their entire presentation in Spanish. Are you up for it? Um, I didn't see Encanto. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> There's time. I'm going first, and I might go too long. So, no. I did see the um, the latest Doctor Strange movie, and uh -huh. there is a gal who uh, who speaks Spanish on a couple of occasions during the film. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, and she, I think she has potential. I think she may, we may see her in future films. So. I hope so. Yeah, I yeah. saw it on Saturday too. So I, I was, how did I miss you? I don't know. I was wearing a cloak, you know. <laughs> I was hidden by a huge uh, sort of uh, box of popcorn. Oh, could be it. And a couple of boys who are who are now bigger, both bigger than I am, even though they're not so old. <laughs> they grow when you feed them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I somehow missed that memo. Missed that, yeah. All right, well, um, it's 6.35. I'm wondering if we should get started. I wanna be cognizant of time. I know people have plans and other things going on and it's a busy time of year this month. So um, why don't we jump into it? So hi everyone, um, I'm Elizabeth Topper Golub. I am the director of OPAL and I'm so happy that you are joining us this evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are, um, for our second annual Opal Spring panel. I guess I can say that. We did it last year, we're here again, so now we're just gonna call it our annual thing. Um, so thank you for joining us. And um, I'm excited because this year we have uh, three of our program directors as our panelists. And um, I know you're gonna be excited to hear about the research that they and their colleagues are working on. So um, first up, we're gonna have Dr. Ryan Kennedy, who is an associate professor in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society, and is director of our post-baccalaureate certificate program in global tobacco control. Uh, and then next we'll have Dr. Frank Carriero, professor of epidemiology and director of our Master of Applied Science and certificate programs in spatial analysis for public health. And then singing to us in his best Spanish, we'll wrap it up with Dr. Albert Wu, professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management and program director for the Master of Applied Science program in patient safety and healthcare quality. So uh, Dr. Kennedy, would you like to start us off? I, I will do my best. Welcome everyone. It's really nice to be here. Uh, this is, um, I realize I'm wearing the same jacket as I have in my photo. So I do have, I have more than one, but it's, I guess this is my favorite. Uh, I am gonna talk through today about our certificate in global tobacco control and we're gonna play a game. So get, get your typing fingers ready in the chat. Um, our program, the certificate in global tobacco control, uh, we've been running for several years now uh, through the Opal platform and it is a certificate that provides rigorous training for folks that um, might be working in uh, tobacco control as scientists or regulators. Um, uh, some of our uh, students tend to work in ministries of um, health or ministries of uh, finance. Often they work in civil society and they're working to advance tobacco control policies. Um, our typical student, if we can say we have a typical student, they are someone early to mid-career uh, living and working in a low and middle income country. Um, and these students, upon completion of our certificate program, um, they receive this official certificate uh, and they have this experience um, and training and also enter uh, a group or a cohort of students and a, a set of alumni that, that connects them with people doing similar work in jurisdictions all over the world. And so our admission requirements are probably similar to other uh, programs you're gonna hear, hear about tonight. Um, we uh, have all applications go through SOFIS. Um, the uh, program is instructed in English and we have uh, some English proficiency, proficiency requirements for that. Um, we also do a personal interview with each applicant that goes through. Um, we um, request uh, documentation from undergraduate training. We ask for a CV and for our program, we ask for three letters of reference and the letters of reference uh, ideally speak to the candidate or the applicants uh, experience uh, working in tobacco control, specifically uh, what or how their career has focused in advancing tobacco control in the jurisdiction that they're working in. Uh, 
the certificate in global tobacco control is part of um, our capacity building efforts at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, which is here at Hopkins. And the Institute has been part of Hopkins for over 20 years. We're largely funded by the Bloomberg uh, Initiative to Reduce Tobacco Use. Uh, and uh, that is um, a partnership around the world with different uh, stakeholders, including the World, world Health Organization, some um, global NGOs like Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, CDC foundations, um, and some other groups too that are all working to support and advance tobacco policies uh, that align with the priorities laid out in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the FCTC. Uh, tobacco use has had a staggering uh, impact on public health. We know from my colleagues uh, over in EPI that in the 20th century, over 100 million people were killed from tobacco use or exposure to tobacco smoke. Uh, and the numbers are staggering for the 21st century, unless we really advance and move quickly to support uh, proven policies that are known to be effective at ad addressing the, um, this horrible state uh, propelled by an industry um, that puts profits above people. Uh, we've seen some really encouraging trends uh, lately, but of course, uh, tobacco use continues to be the leading cause of death and disease in the world. I think often in public health, we think about tobacco control as one of those success stories. It's something that often gets presented as something we've done really well. Uh, and we have, we have, I think, uh, smoking rates among uh, US high school students, for example, is under 5% now. And it wasn't that long ago, it was over 35%. Uh, this is a huge success. But of course, um, in terms of the impact of tobacco use globally, the majority of um, deaths are now coming in low and middle income countries. Okay, so we're going to play a game now uh, in the chat. It's going to be called Name That Tobacco Product and Where It's From. Is everyone excited about this game? <laughs> okay, you're all welcome to participate and you don't have to sing, Albert. Okay, this one. Any guesses what kind of tobacco product that is and where it might come from? You can put your answers in the chat. I can't actually see the, oh, now I can, okay. Neverland, yeah, a chewing tobacco. So chewing tobacco is a term that we often use in North America to describe like a dip or a chew, um, which describes like the way the tobacco has been cut. Uh, this is a smokeless tobacco that's uh, named Pawn, and it's gonna be tobacco mixed with different spices. Uh, and it's gonna be commonly used in South Asia. Um, all right, good job, everyone. And I, I included this one. This is another smokeless tobacco product um, from India. Uh, and I, I included this one because it has the graphic health warning label. Um, so we've been working really hard in the tobacco control to encourage um, countries to require tobacco industries to include um, labels like this on their tobacco products. Of course, with something like this, it's very small. And so the health warning label is very small. And um, uh, but I think it's still, I, I think we can agree that it's pretty graphic in nature and uh, has high emotional salience. Okay, this one, any guesses? Where this one might come from? Thailand, we've got a guess from Craig. Is that based on the um, image and the lettering? India, Turkey, yeah. So this is actually a tin of smokeless tobacco too, and it's from Bangladesh. And so um, a lot of smokeless tobacco is sold in those single use packets that we saw, but this is actually one that's more uh, akin to what you might find in North America, where it's a larger tin you open up and would use, um, take out the products in, to use. Okay, this one. This is a picture of the package and the image on the right is the bottom of the package. Any guesses what this one is? And the use of pictures of people is really common in some tobacco products around the world. Pipe tobacco, good guys. These are from Uttar Pradesh, a very popular state in India. Is that helpful? They're a combustible product. Cretex, good guess, Ashley. Uh, Indonesia, more likely if we're looking at Cretex. Hookah tobacco, these are actually beaties which are hand rolled uh, tobacco products that are burned. 
Uh, and from our perspective, if you look at the image here, smoking kills, that's the health warning label that is on a product. This is almost like a newspaper that's been used to wrap up the beauty products that are inside. Okay, this one. So creative, yes, <laughs> deliver the poison. This one, if you look closely, there's a little bit of a hint where this product is from. Brazil, yes. <laughs> We've got Brazil. Okay, so Ashley, what kind of uh, tobacco product is that? I'll show you the back of that product. You're two for two. <laughs> so this is um, roll your own tobacco. So this is loose tobacco that you would put in a product like this to uh, roll your own. Uh, we can see here, this is a the roll your own, the cigarettes include a paper, this is a filter and whatever um, style of tobacco you're gonna have. I'm not sure in Brazil which kind this is. Brazil is a mixed market, meaning that they have um, some cigarettes that are blended cigarettes, like an American blended cigarette. And some are Virginia flu cured, which is more a style of tobacco that you might find in a um, country like the UK or um, Commonwealth countries. Okay, this one, it, doesn't it look delicious? We've got some grapes there, sort of suggesting that it's flavored, sweet. And this is again, you can see the health warning. So you know this one's from Brazil again. So these would be what they call straw cigarettes or um, uh, so it's a combustible product as well. Brazil has some fantastic health warning labels. You can see the one on the right here. This is a newer product. Um, these are going to be, I think, really interesting for all of us that work in tobacco regulatory science and the students that might be interested in this certificate program. Vilao Ice Cool, it has it right there. It's called a nicotine pouch. It looks like gum. Uh, it comes in flavors that you might think are gum, but these are um, a lot like snus or some of the tobacco products you might find in what looks like a tea bag that you would put in your mouth an oral tobacco product. And what's really interesting about some of these products, um, Bilo I think is made by British America tobacco, but some of them are using nicotine that's not derived from tobacco. They're using nicotine that is synthetic nicotine. So made in the lab, uh, which in some countries and jurisdictions means that it might not fall under their tobacco laws because it's not technically a tobacco product. Juul is, of course, a product that we're all very familiar with, and we've had some regulatory um, actions there, specifically banning um, flavored pods, uh, apart from menthol and uh, classic or tobacco flavor. One of the things Juul did really well was that they chemically um, had a different strategy for their e-liquids. Uh, cigarettes like Marlboro have used uh, additives like ammonia in their products for years to um, change the way the nicotine uh, is structured and how that would bind to your nicotinic receptors. Uh, the chemists and engineers at Juul uh, went the other way and added an acid to their e-liquids. Um, benzoic acid or levulinic acid is common in these. And that acid smooths out the product, actually alters the pH to make it closer to water, which means that if you are inhaling an aerosol matted made of these liquids, you can inhale it really deeply without as much irritation. And if, I think this is my last product that I was going to share with you. Um, this is Icos. This is the Philip Morris product. And this is, it looks like a cigarette. These sheets products look a lot like cigarettes. They're a paper with tobacco inside, but instead of paralysis, instead of burning the product, it's heated. And it's heated to a temperature where it is, uh, essentially aerosolizes constituents in the tobacco. So you still in your draw or your inhale of the device, we'll get some of the um, sensory dimensions, the uh, mouthfeel, the flavors, and the nicotine delivery uh, that you might with uh, combustible tobacco or cigarettes, uh, but without paralysis. So those are some of the things we cover in our course in tobacco regulatory science. We cover um, issues of the product, we cover um, what and how to enact policies like health warning labels, um, what and how, um, countries might consider increasing their capacity for testing of products to understand their design and what and how you can regulate based on products. It's a one-year certificate. Um, we start in first term and go to the end of fourth term. It's entirely online and a lot of our courses are available asynchronously. So you can, um, given the global audience that tends to enroll in our certificate, that's very helpful. Uh, students take two courses per term and um, the, uh, the 
um, courses are laid out here. We, uh, in the first term, have a course on um, global tobacco control, which is a bit of a history uh, of our movement, and strategic communications, because to be a leader in tobacco control, you need to be very good at communicating with others. And um, uh, in the second term, we have our tobacco regulatory class, which we focus on aspects of the framework convention on tobacco control, articles nine and 10, what and how to regulate products, uh, and a leadership course, as, uh, again, because that's a very important skill for people to have um, that are going to be um, leaders or emerging leaders in our field. Um, we make sure our students get sufficient quantitative uh, analysis skills so that they are capable of understanding different uh, scientific um, papers, what and how to design studies that they might need for their own needs assessments or similar. And we do a writing workshop too, and, which is very helpful for students. Um, and finally, we have qualitative methods, which are often new for some of the people that enroll in our course who've maybe had more of a um, science background, haven't used um, social science methods that might involve qualitative methods, uh, and an implementation of tobacco control policies course, where we know and understand, the instructors focus on what and how to support the implementation of our laws. These are our lovely instructors um, that I don't need to go to <laughs> specifically, um, but just to um, say that we benefit from all the support that is provided through OPAL in terms of the technical support and the platforms that students conduct their learning in. And um, a unique uh, feature of our certificate is that uh, students that apply from low and middle income countries are eligible to apply for um, a scholarship that can cover the entire cost of the certificate. And I think, how do I do for time? I think that's, I think that's me. I think you did great for time. Um, thank you very much. And I'm not sure about anyone else. I didn't expect to play a game tonight, so that was fun. So <laughs> um, I you all we, did very well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. We can also do sort of overall questions for the panelists at the end, which is fine. For sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to share our certificate program and um, remind folks uh, how exciting tobacco control is. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, well, now we're gonna hear from Dr. Curriero, who is our program director in spatial analysis for public health. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. So I'm actually gonna talk to you about some research that we recently did um, here at the school that used a lot of techniques that um, are part of our spatial analysis program. So the title here is Aggregated Spatial Intensity, a Method for Improved Choropleth Mapping for Exposure Assessment. And I'll discuss what I mean by um, a lot of that as we go through. So it's a spatial analysis program. I think there is a map, at least one map on every slide, except for maybe this slide and the last slide. So let's start. You just got to hide everybody's pictures here so I can see the actual slides. So I'm going to start off with what is a choropleth map. So you see this map over here on the right. Um, it's what we call a choropleth map. Um, just to give you some landmarks for geography here, it's Baltimore City in the center here um, with its five surrounding counties. We call that the Baltimore MSA Metropolitan Statistical Area. The counties are outlined in blue. Baltimore City is a county itself. You see that at the center. And, um, and you have this color shading. Okay, so if you Googled up what is, and this is called a choropleth map. And if you Googled up what, what is a choropleth map, you'll find something very technical. It's a type of statistical thematic map that uses intensity of colors, like you see over here, to correspond with an aggregate summary of a geographic characteristic within spatial enumeration units. Okay, that, that's, that's a mouthful. Um, what it's saying is here, what, what I'm plotting here is the number of fast food restaurants per census tract. So you see the county boundaries, what these finer scale geographies, they're called census tracts, okay? And they're common administrative units that we use a lot in, in public health. So this map, this corpleth map is basically counting the number of fast food restaurants, here's a legend down here, that are located in each one of these census tracts. And the color shading denotes the scale on, on the legend here. And this is likely the most popular type of map um, not, just, not just for public health, but outside of public health um, as well. So that's a choropleth map. So why choropleth maps? Why are they that popular? Well, a lot of times, you know, the data 
doesn't start out as, as an aggregate summary. Okay, it starts out as what we call a point pattern or a dot map. And you see this over here on the right. So this is the actual locations of those fast food restaurants throughout the Baltimore MSA. Showing a map like this could be busy, okay? And, and it's not as easy on the eyes as, as the aggregate summary of the core left map. So a lot of times we say we aggregate up to smooth out some of that variation you see on the right-hand side, okay? And, and hopefully patterns become more apparent. So that's one of the reasons why we, um, we aggregate up, okay? So this here, here's the raw data that comes to us. We count the number per census track or the software we use, the GIS software we use to, to do all this stuff in our program generates these counts and you're able to map it at the census track level. Um, sometimes we're required to put it at the census track level. So, I mean, at, at an aggregate unit, not only is it easy to interpret in, in a sense and, and can show patterns amongst a lot of the noise that you might see over here on the right, but sometimes it's required for, for policymaking and stakeholders want to see neighborhoods, which census tracts are often used for, for neighborhoods. Um, also with confidentiality and disclosure, you know, we're in public health, right? So if we're talking about disease case locations or household locations, we can't show that information. So a lot of times the data may exist like this, but we have to present it in an aggregate form, in a core cleft map type form. Um, but there are limitations to this core cleft map that I don't think gets discussed enough. And if that's, and the first limitation that I'll talk about is with any aggregate data, you don't know about the variation within that aggregate unit. So when you see this core cleft map, you don't know the variation of fast food locations within each census tract. You don't know where they are. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes we don't want to know. We just want to get that aggregate summary. But if we're thinking about exposure events, okay, both good and bad types of exposure. So maybe crime, fast food locations, or, or the food environment itself, um, alcohol, tobacco outlets, those type of retailers, or good exposure, you know, playing green spaces. If if the dots are near a border, okay, or maybe just on a border or just off a border, they're all gonna get counted for one census tract and not the other. You know, but if you live in that adjacent census tract or that adjacent neighborhood, you know, and there's some near the border, but they're just over that, that line, that, that geographic boundary, um, it's not gonna get counted. So you're gonna be talked about as having lower exposure versus higher exposure versus those. And these census tract boundaries, just like county boundaries, I mean, they're not hard boundaries. I mean, we don't know oftentimes when we're crossing over these boundaries. You know, I doubt any, I mean, we all probably know our, our county designation, I'm sure we do, but I doubt everybody um, knows what their census tract is. You know, what census tract your house is in. You know, I know, I think Tim is on the call, so he probably knows the census tract of his house and any other geographer would probably know. It's 11, div, it's 11 digit code, FIPS code it's called, um, that identifies your census tract, but you don't know it when you're walking over it or driving over it. Okay, so when you have these dots or these exposure events that are on or near the border, it would be better to somehow share that information across census tracts when you're doing the core cleft map. And that's what I want to discuss here. That's the research I want to discuss here. So um, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about a tobacco retail exposure in Newcastle County. So we're, we're following off of a, uh, a, a good first talk on, on tobacco. Okay, so this is uh, the map you see in the middle. This is Newcastle County, Delaware. This is the, um, Delaware has three counties. This is the northernmost county in, uh, in Delaware. And, and Maryland is over here on, I don't know my cursor, this side, whoops, sorry. You know, New Jersey over here and, and Philadelphia up here. Um, there are 642 tobacco retail, retailers in Newcastle County. And, and you see a core cleft here. So this is a straight up core cleft. And I've added the dots on the map here to show where those actual retailers are, okay? And these track borders are often chosen as, as major roadways, you know, as, as defining the census defines the, these regions, you know, to be about 4,000 people per census tract. And they're often used roadways or more major roadways to, to define those borders. Retailers, again, because their retailers are often on more major roadways and you can see where these dots are here, you know, I'm looking at this one right here, this track here, you can see this major roadway coming up here. There's a lot of retailers right on that border or right to the left or to the right of it, okay? In fact, in this example, 
more than two thirds or just about two thirds of, of those tobacco retailers are with 100 meters of a track border. And over 80% are within 200 meters of a track border. Okay, so those are walking distances. Okay, so when you're talking about your exposure to, to tobacco retail, um, and this was done with the study about current and former smokers, are they more likely to quit, not quit if they're surrounded by more um, tobacco outlets? And, and a lot of times people aggregate the data up because if our health count comes, current and former smokers comes in an aggregate form like census tracts, they would want to aggregate up the, the exposure as well. Um, but that could be an issue here because you could, for example, look at this track that I, sorry, for example, look at this track here I, I keep talking about. This has got a low count. It's got between three and five. But you can see there are plenty along the border here. I can't exactly remember. I think there's about 15 or so along that border that just might be to the left or to the right of that. But only between three and five were actually counted within that census tract there. And this was actually a, um, a paper we just recently got published um, between where Maddie Brooks was the, the main author on that paper. And I'll talk a little bit about Maddie on the last slide. So. One way we can talk about this idea of sharing, okay, is, is use a technique what's called spatial intensity. And again, this spatial intensity technique is something we, we talk about in our program, okay? So spatial intensity estimates the expected number of events per unit area. So in the middle, you see the tobacco retailer dot map. And on the right-hand side is the estimated spatial intensity of those dots. And basically, it's just a smooth version of those dots. I put the formula down there. We're not going to talk about the formula uh, today, but spatial intensity gives you that heat map type look. Okay, we're a smooth version of, of the dot map. And um, an analogy, and don't laugh at me for this analogy, I, I didn't come up with it myself, but but I like it enough that, that I keep repeating it. And um, if there's anybody that is actually from the spatial analysis program on the call, you'll remember this as an example. But you can imagine, well, what is spatial intensity, okay? So you see the dot map here in the center. Imagine putting a piece of chocolate on each one of those dots, okay? And the dots that are really close together, the chocolate's gonna start piling up, okay? And then what you do is you take a hairdryer, okay? And you start going over that whole map. And somebody asked me one time in class, am I ever gonna actually do this? Um, I don't know. I may have to give it a try one time. But you put that, that heat source, that, that, that hair dryer, and the chocolate starts to melt, and it starts to disperse, okay? And that's what you see on the right-hand side. That's that spatial intensity. It's kind of smoothing out those, those hills and valleys of the piles of chocolate, which just represent the density of the concentration of, of those tobacco retailers. The key point is, is no matter how much you smooth that out, the chocolate remains the same. You never added or removed any chocolate. So all the information that is in that center map is also on that right-hand side, that smooth version of that, um, of that spatial intensity or that heat map. And what's nice about the spatial intensity map on the right, it's, it's independent of, of any geography. It's independent of those track boundaries because it's, it's melting that chocolate across the boundaries, okay? So the idea here is to, so on the left-hand side, you see the, the choroplath count. On the right-hand side is you see that estimated intensity, okay? And then the idea here is to, is to aggregate the intensity. So sum up those intensities, and this is on a very fine pixelated image, right? So I probably have, you know, thousands of, of pixels across this, this Newcastle County geography, and intensity is estimated each one of those pixels. Okay, so now take those pixels that are within each track and add those up because it's the expected number of events. Okay, add those up and make a choroplath of that. And that's what you see on the on panel C on, on the far right hand side, which is a way to kind of share information across boundaries. And you can think about it. If I had a, a retailer exactly on a location, you might say, well, let me give half of it to one track and half of it to the other track. Okay, and this idea of aggregated spatial intensity is sort of a statistical way to do that. Because what happens now if it's, well, it's 100 meters into the other track? Well, do I give it two thirds in that track and one third in the other track? You know, you can make that more objective by doing this statistical spatial intensity approach. And, um, and for those in the class and those who are thinking about spatial analysis, 
um, these techniques, you know, the, the core cleft mapping, spatial intensity, that's all covered in our program. Aggregated intensity is just an idea we had to follow up to do this, this, this concept of sharing locations across. And you can see now on the right hand side, you can see this track now is highlighted a lot darker. Now it's between nine and 14. Okay, so it's it got all this sharing. You can see you can see sort of that that shading around each retailer is giving you an idea of, of the amount of sharing that's going on between um, between tracks. So we talked about the core flat map limitations. It ignores variation within the units, and when we're talking about exposure on the border or near the border, becomes an issue. Okay, and this aggregated intensity allows sharing across geographic boundaries. Here is the actual, um, the citation here. And just a point I want to make is that Maddie Brooks is a 2019 graduate of the Opal Spatial Analysis Certificate Program. And, um, and I had this idea to do spatial intensity, you know, aggregate spatial intensity. She followed up with it um, in the year since she's graduated. She is at Christiana Care Hospital Research Center that is in um, Newcastle County, Delaware. And Maddie is also now just um, accepted into our PhD program in, in epidemiology. So she'll be starting in August. So we're looking forward to having her. That's it. That's great. Thank you so much, Frank. And good mm -hmm. for Maddie. Congratulations. Yes. Please uh, extend our good wishes to Maddie. That's great news. Any questions for right now? I'm so happy that you used a paper from one of the MAS graduates for this talk. Yes. Really great. So we have so far talked about different kinds of tobacco products and the importance of the um, health communications and the messaging that goes out to try and warn people uh, and steer them away from unhealthy behaviors. We've seen how maps can be used to, um, to show where these products are being sold, possibly where illness is happening as a result. And when people smoke too much, they get sick and they end up in the hospital. That's the best segue I could come up with. <laughs> so um, Albert, we're not gonna ask you to sing. And I'm certainly hoping you don't present in Spanish because I personally won't understand you. Um, but I'm excited to hear what you have to tell us about the work that's going on in patient safety and healthcare quality. So I am here to confess um, about some of my personal errors. And um, the, the first, uh, and that is not paying enough attention early in life to things that I should have. Um, when I was, uh, when I was in third grade, I was fortunate to attend a sort of an advanced school, um, advanced compared to the East Coast in Palo Alto, California. And everyone had been learning Spanish since for the first grade. Um, I was already a couple of years behind and was honestly confused. I, I barely, you know, I'd, I'd um, there wasn't evidence that I was particularly good in English or any language, but I just didn't pay enough attention and later really regretted uh, when uh, I wound up working in Ecuador and uh, Colombia and, uh, and uh, Peru and elsewhere. Um, I and also for that matter in, um, in Spain, um, I you know, sort of kicked myself. I was saying, how stupid could I be? Um, I took French in, um, in middle school and uh, from Madame Maubusson, who was uh, not, who just basically made us recite things from a book um, and then taught us about verb conjugation. I didn't, wasn't aware that there was verb conjugation in English. Um, you know, it was back in the day, they didn't really teach you grammar because it was, you know, it was overly academic. And so again, I did not pay enough attention and was really sad about it when, um, I, when I lived in Geneva, uh, which is a French speaking canton in, uh, in, um, in Switzerland and everyone spoke French except me. And that was, you know, really sad. Um, 
uh, as a, you know, as one of the only Asian kids in Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, uh, growing up, um, even though my parents spoke Mandarin or Cantonese or both, um, I, of course, just wanted to, to, you know, to assimilate. And so never really learned Mandarin properly. And when I worked in Taiwan and in um, and with our students in Tsinghua University, um, you know, I, I felt stupid and and people would scold me, cab drivers and people in the restaurants, and they would just all scold me for not speaking Mandarin. So I think the lesson is there that um, I don't know if you should listen to your parents or you should just pay attention or if we should teach differently to convince people that the things that they, you know, you know that are on offer can be really important. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's see here. I don't have a, a ton of slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, can you see any, can you see my screen? I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the pro are uh, the, the, the masters or the, um, I'm going to tell you more, Mas, about the the uh, Opal program in patient safety and healthcare quality. That's it for the Spanish. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm, if anyone else can help me, I I, I um, you know I accept all assistance because I realize now that I've made so many mistakes that uh, I should just I should always take advice. So, on the one hand. Um, Organizations pay a lot of attention to uh, things they can see, and um, uh, or, or or things that they've been taught are important. And uh, we, of course, in the in the last couple of years, paid a, a, quite a lot of attention to COVID. Maybe not as much as we should have, but um, and as we as we've learned you know, perhaps as many as a million Americans died of COVID in the last two years. In the same time, probably half a million people died of, of problems related to patient safety. But this is a little bit more of an invisible um, pandemic because um, it's people are not labeled. Um, you know, I uh, suffered a, a, a medical error and, um, and uh, it's, not a, it's not a diagnosis that goes on death certificates and there's no test that you can do. Um, but Peter Pronovost, who is the former director of the Armstrong Institute, which I'll talk about, and also senior vice president of quality and safety for Johns Hopkins Medicine said, organizations profess patient safety as a top priority because we've learned that that much, but they're still figuring out how to manage it with the same rigor discipline and accountability that they do their budgets. We have a lot of accountants working for the hospital and for the health system and even for the university. Um, and we now have quite a few people working in patient safety, but that's been only a recent innovation. Um, I'll quote a couple of statistics. Um, among people who are hospitalized for anything, on average, one in 10 of those people is harmed in some way, a slight or severe, while receiving care, which is intended to help them. Uh, adverse uh, medic med medication errors might be the most prevalent um, uh, medical error, and there are at least a million and a half preventable adverse drug events in the US every year. The cost of, um, the, of harm from healthcare is, well in excess of $100 billion a year. And there's some debate, but uh, although we used to focus on medication errors because they're a little bit easier to understand, um, inaccurate diagnoses, misdiagnoses may be even more common. Now, so these are all statistics, but perhaps more uh, important uh, on a personal level is uh, the, the story of this little girl, Josie King who um, on February 22nd, um, just about 20 years ago, uh, died at Johns Hopkins Hospital from a series of preventable medication errors. And Josie, as it turns out, is a little bit of a superhero um, at Johns Hopkins. 
he and her sadly her her superpower was that she um was um uh, young and relatable and it was very clear that errors had been made in her care and her story um went uh went, went a long way and in fact went around the world um when she, she um she actually lives um about her family lives about uh two miles away from my house here in baltimore and they had uh, recently moved into this new house and she while they were having a housewarming party um stumbled uh, crawled up into the up to the second floor into a bathtub turned on the hot water um, and was scalded badly and uh, was rushed to the hospital. And she was taken care of quite well, um, in first in the burn unit and then on surgery. But, um, but there were several handoffs from the, burn, from the burn team to the surgical team and then in the ICU and then to a step down unit. And things were missed, a couple of things. One was, um, that uh, her fluid status was not, perhaps not that clearly charted. And the second thing was that ultimately she um, uh, developed sepsis, but that was undiagnosed uh, the entire time she was in the hospital. Um, when her, she was getting a little bit better, but then perhaps got a little worse. Um, and on a, an evening when her mother was visiting the hospital and holding her and washing her feet, um, she was given a medication, a pain medication that she'd been getting around the clock um, and had a respiratory arrest um, and uh, she could not be resuscitated. She was coded for an hour and she died. And this was now in many ways more tragic than, and if you're feeling this, she, this is more tragic than um, 44 or 98,000 people uh, dying of medication errors. This is one little girl um, who was the center of the world of many people. And her mother was as furious as a human being could be um, at Johns Hopkins. Um, we, in fact, as, as soon as we were allowed to, uh, went out to the public and said, we uh, have to confess that we made a, a terrible series of errors in the care of this little girl. And she died. This was preventable, this should not have happened. And we are gonna do everything we can, we accept responsibility and we're gonna do everything we can to try to prevent this from happening again. Sorel's king in Sorel's, uh, Sorel, Josie's mother is still angry at us in many ways, um, but, and, had, and threatened, had threatened to go to the newspaper, to Good Morning America. And we, we sort of leaned in and we said, we'll go with you. And uh, Peter Pronovost went on Good Morning America with her um, and they talked about the tragedy that ha had happened. And they talked about uh, um, how it had affected uh, the, her family and in fact, how it had affected her team that was taking care of her and how this was a problem that was, had recently been discovered in a way in, in the year 2000, but, um, but can affect um, individuals in, in this way. And um, she and Peter went to and presented her case to pedi pediatric grand rounds. Um, all of Josie's team, the nurses, the doctors, the others on the, on the floor um, who had taken care of her attended um, in this um, very steep and uh, old fashioned looking operating theater that, uh, or auditorium now, um, in the center of the old hospital. And Josie, uh, Josie's mother, Sorel, told the story and cried and people stood in the back and, and cried about Josie's loss. And that was a moment that the hospital understood that something needed to be done to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. So this was the, a little bit of the origin story of patient safety. At Johns Hopkins um, in 2000, 1999 or 2000, uh, the Institute of Medicine had published a landmark report to Air is Human and identified patient safety as a nationwide and, in fact, a worldwide problem. Um, Josie's death happened shortly after that. And in fact, in 2002, Sorrell's family donated 
the settlement money from Josie's death back to the hospital to create a center for innovation in quality and quality patient care. Um, and the president of the university and the president of the hospital um, and the dean got together and said, we need to do something about this. In 2003, we started a research group, the Quality and Safety Research Group, and got the first, uh, some of the first grants in the, in, the, in the US to work on patient safety, the problems of patient safety. Um, in uh, 2007 and eight, uh, um, uh, I and another uh, colleague, uh, Cyrus Engineer, uh, were loaned to Geneva, uh, WHO in Geneva for a couple of years to work on the New World Alliance for Patient Safety and worked on the hand hygiene campaign and the safe surgery campaign and um, uh, adopt the adoption of checklists to um, uh, increase reliability of, of, of care. And in 2011, Mike Armstrong, who was uh, the chairman of the board of Johns Hopkins Hospital, made a, a, a substantial gift, $10 million, to create the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety. Um, he, uh, for those of you who are ever on campus, he also donated money for um, the perhaps unsurprisingly named Armstrong Education Building for the medical students. Um, but uh, he made this donation and another a subsequent, uh, another gift a few years later, uh, another gift of $10 million to uh, create a safety institute that would really focus both academics and um, uh, clinical operations to improve safety. So the Armstrong Institute has now been um, in operation for more than 10 years. And the goal is in fact, first to provide oversight and manage quality and safety operations for all of Johns Hopkins Medicine all of its hospitals uh, in the US and also uh, uh, outside of the US, for example, there was a Johns Hopkins in Singapore. There's currently a Johns Hopkins hospital in Saudi Arabia um, and the Armstrong Institute manages safety in all of these uh, organizations. The idea is to uh, apply research thinking to operations to, pr to provide the evidence and to, to translate the evidence into practice. Um, to provide thought leadership for quality and safety um, in the US and around the world, to uh, develop the science of safety, to build capacity uh, internally and nationwide and worldwide, and to advocate for more evidence-based measures, uh, better policy, more investments in safety research to, uh, to move the field forward. Um, there are now projects in um, all over the world, really. Um, uh, some of these are research projects. Others are um, hospitals that are being supported in part uh, by, by teams at Johns Hopkins. Um, at Johns Hopkins Aramco Healthcare in Saudi, uh, the CEO, the chief medical officer, um, uh, at the, um, and the director of safety are all, uh, and the direction, the director of operations are all Hopkins faculty, for example. Um, the program at Johns Hopkins is, uh, which many of you know about already, is a, like all of these programs, is a full master's degree program. It is, uh, the credit requirements are a little bit lighter than for our MPH because the, the curriculum is very focused and it's really focused to educate students and primarily practitioners um, uh, to, and to give them tools, skills and tools to improve uh, uh, the quality and the safety of healthcare. The curriculum in, is, uh, this is a accredited by, um, uh, by, uh, by the uh, public by public health, um, as opposed to business or management or, or anything else. And um, there are a, a few courses which go along with any master's in, in public health, uh, a master's degree in public health, but there are, the heart of the, the, the degree are a course on the science of safety, a course on uh, the quality of care, um, and then some, 
courses that are um, not offered anywhere else in the university, quality improvement tools, um, leadership for change, um, measurement and evaluation in safety, infection prevention, um, something which is which attracted other students actually, uh, which we allowed in for the year uh, to take the course uh, during the COVID pandemic, a measurement lab in quality and safety, um, and so forth. This is the most interdisciplinary thing that I do. And in fact, the faculty are all affiliated with the Armstrong Institute and come from the School of Public Health, from the School of Medicine, from the School of Nursing, actually also from the Kerry Business School and the Engineering School. Uh, I think that something that's unique about this program is it's it, we have uh, it, a, a large number of faculty, all of whom are experts in their own uh, particular field. Um, Hopkins, of course, has a lot of experience with online learning and the course is designed for, uh, to be convenient for practitioners. The large majority of students are in fact practicing something related to quality or, and safety or is working or are working their way up to doing so. Um, just a few of our faculty, uh, I'll, I'll point out, um, Matt Austin is a, a PhD measurement expert who also leads uh, quality and safety measurement for the, uh, the, um, the Leapfrog group, which is one of the most prominent business collaboratives interested in quality. Um, Renee Demsky, uh, was until uh, a couple of years ago, director of operations for patient safety for, for the Armstrong Institute, um, and is now actually, uh, I think, worldwide director for uh, safety and quality for United Healthcare. Um, uh, Lisa Maragakis is the uh, director of hospital epidemiology and infection control for Johns Hopkins and was the lead commander um, in our COVID uh, command center for the last two years and possibly the most influential person for those two years in the, in the entire health system. Jill Marsteller is a renowned expert in evaluation of programs. Um, Lori Payne is the nurse director of patient safety for Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, Peter Pronovost uh, is perhaps one of our mo most famous faculty members or actually now former faculty members um, but uh, is most famous for introducing the checklist to, in, to, to medicine and safety. Uh, Mike Rosen is um, uh, one of the leaders in teamwork training. I'm sorry, I, I confused Renee with, uh, Renee with M Melinda Sawyer, uh, who is the, who's the person at United Healthcare, and, um, and who is an expert in uh, unit-based safety programs. And Kathy Sutcliffe was the person who originated the theory of high reliability organizations um, and is the world's leading expert on that topic. So all of these people teach our courses um, and are working um, uh, as well on uh, trying to advance safety uh, within the Institute. There are um, many more positions these days for those. Th this is not really a, I suppose we are a professional school, but uh, though, though our graduates go on to do things besides practice, um, but uh, there are many uh, opportunities now in, in the areas of quality and safety. Virtually every, this wasn't true even five years ago when we began, but virtually every hospital now has a patient safety officer. Um, and uh, it very likely has a vice president or director of quality and safety for, for, the, for their institution. Um, there are many other opportunities. So I'm gonna stop there, um, probably because we're kind of out of time, I realized. I'm very happy to talk to anybody about any of these topics. Um, send me an email at awu at jhu.edu. If you're dying to follow one more person on Twitter, I'm with you, Dr. Wu. Bonus points if you could figure out the illusion where where that um, where Doctor Wu the illusion to Doctor Wu comes from. You'll have to tell us if no one figures it out. Thank you so much. Um, any questions?
I actually have some, um, if no one else does. So, um, Albert, I want to thank you for sharing that story, which I had actually never heard before, and I'm not going to soon forget little Josie King's face or her story. Um, it's a sad story, but it's an important story. So thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, you had said that, I think you said that one in 10 hospitalized people are harmed while receiving care. And I, it struck me, I was wondering, do they know? I mean, clearly in some cases they do, but like, is it feasible that there's a good portion of those people who don't know that that happened to them? I, I imagine there's a lot of different types of harm that can happen. It's not always gonna be a, a wrong medication or a, a wrong dose. No, and those, and that's, I'm talking actually about an injury and not a mistake, which, which, you know, are a little bit different. It is, this is on average and not, and some hospitals, in some hospitals, it's fewer people. And in some people, some hospitals, it's more people than one in 10. So, um, but many of the injuries are minor. Um, they might be a physiologic change. Your liver might be irritated by a medication. Um, you might develop a stomach ache because of a medication. Uh, you might develop a fever or a rash. Uh, and others are, are quite severe. So it, it, it's, it runs the gamut. But um, the, probably the important thing is some and perhaps the majority of these incidents are, could be prevented or could have been prevented. Got it. Thank you. Oh, Ryan, I was going to ask you a question, but it looks like you have your hands full there. <laughs> the puppy just came home, so yeah. <laughs> the pets of Zoom. <laughs> so my question for you may not be answerable, sure. um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So how can we ever expect to beat the tobacco industry? Like, is it feasible to imagine a tobacco-free world? Or is that not the goal? Is it a shorter, a, a goal that stops short of that? Yeah, I mean, in the context of how we beat them, the terminology that we sometimes use in our field is the end game. Like how do we achieve the end game? And there are jurisdictions like New Zealand that have just instituted a policy where they're gonna have a graduated minimum age of purchase. So people born after a certain age won't be allowed to purchase tobacco. Um, this is associated with additional sort of controls. I mean, we're getting really creative in the field and what and how we're going to address these things. Um, there were calls in Canada years ago for the, um, you know, devalue the industry so much with more and more regulation that the industry is worth less and less such that the government could buy it out and then dismantle it. You know, there, the, there's different ways that we think about it and they're very specific to the jurisdictions we're working in. And I think what's really encouraging is the students that go through our program are working in so many different settings and we're really trying to build them with, up with the skills and um, critical thinking and collaborative um, networks such that they can uh, determine and problem solve what are the best approaches for their jurisdiction for us to yeah, fi finally beat an industry that's been charged with racketeering and they've lied and cheated for decades. Not easy, but, but that's why we need you and, and all of you who are, who are you know, working in this area. Thank you. Um, Frank, are you still on the call? I'm awake. Great, <laughs> can, I, can I throw a question your way as well? Of course you can. So um, I was wondering, and I was wondering if others were wondering, um, where did the data come from that go into the maps that you were showing us? Is it, is it, are these data coming out of research studies? Are they coming from health departments? Are they coming from other sources? All the data I showed today is publicly available. Um, all the geographies, counties, census tracts, census block groups, those are uh, tiger line files. They're available from, uh, from the census. Um, the tobacco outlet retailers and other type retailers, you know, each state has their own agency where you can download a lot of this information. Um, there, there's business directories where you can get certain types of fast food restaurants and, and those kind of things. Um, data is, is a lot more available now than, than it used to be. Um, obviously, health outcomes, that, that's, the, that's what comes specific from your study. 
you know, um, whether it's through, you know, primary data collection or a data use agreement with the health department or, or something like that. But um, most of the, all the data I showed today was uh, publicly available. Great, thank you. Um, Ryan, I see there's a question for you in the chat. Do the students doing the tobacco certificate gain any experience with negotiation? I'm wondering what tools they learn in order to help deal with the challenges that might exist with industry in their region. Yeah, it's both the comms class and the leadership class. They do different um, techniques of role playing and people study sort of perspectives. And in some cases, um, they'll go into negotiations where some of the students are um, industry reps and others are government regulators and they will um, sort of navigate and practice what and how to um, it's in the context of sort of honing a message and delivering a message and listening and in the in the moment um, I don't know that like negotiation is one of the sort of um, objectives of that specifically but it's certainly something that um, can be driven by students indicating what sort of scenarios they want to work on I agree it's a really important um, the one thing with the tobacco industry, though, is that we try not to negotiate. <laughs> There's not a negotiation here. This is, it's not um, other sectors and even some of the work I do at Hopkins from the Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science. I think it's very common for other fields, whether it's farmer, you know, to sit down and have more discussions. But um, in my sector, I would never sit down with the tobacco industry. So. Fair enough. Other questions? All right, well, if not, um, I wanna thank everyone. A, a specific thank you to our three panelists for sharing your work and your perspectives tonight. We really appreciate your time and all of the great work that you're doing. And thank you to all of the students and uh, hopefully prospective students for joining us. Um, we wish you the best and hope that you will uh, be successful in your continued studies and in your future work. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Elizabeth. <laughs>